Good afternoon, morning, evening, depending on where you are, of course. Uh, this wonderful session, which we're about to have another keynote speaker, we've heard uh, re uh, recently, just now, from from Courtney Robinson of of IKO about where we're going as as a group, uh, forced on us uh, or uh, brought into, shall we say, by government authorities through the states and through the United Nations and IKO. And one of the things that he spoke about a lot was digitization and the need for it, but the industry itself. Um, is going through a bit of a metamorphosis. And as we transition from one uh, state of, of, of being into another, uh, it's important to look into what's happening in the industry now and where an expert opinion can come into advising us on where perhaps we should be going. And I can think of nobody better than Ken DeWitt Hammer, who is the director of World ACD. Um, and they have their finger on the pulse for sure of what, what is happening now. But I would be very interested, Ken, to hear from you uh, what your feelings are about the future as well. So welcome, Ken, and, and hopefully um, you'll, uh, you'll have some information from us for us. Uh, thanks very much, Stan. Uh, and thank you for inviting me to be part of your uh, conference. Uh, well, you're welcome, Ken, and, and truly, uh, we're really looking forward to it. Ken is... Uh, Director of World ACT. Uh, for those of you who don't know it, and I think almost everybody does, Ken. Um, Ken is uh, responsible for all of the commercial activities of uh, World ACT, and that's interfacing with all of the clients, which are some of the biggest uh, service providers in the industry. He works with uh, all the professionals in those companies in the air freight around the world, so he has good business intelligence on, from all of the uh, regions. And uh, Ken's no stranger to the business. He's worked in transportation industry for over 20 years with international experience in management consultancy, marketing, and sales in the aviation and express business. So with that background, uh, Ken, I think uh, you're easily uh, one of the most qualified people to look at data and look at what's going on in, in your relationship with your clients, getting some opinions. So I'd like to turn it over to you um, to, to walk us through what you do, and then maybe we can get into some questions afterwards about how you do it, and, and maybe some of your personal opinions on where we're going. So Ken, if I could turn it over to you, and Salam, perhaps you could put up the first slides. Great, Ken, Salam. Thank fun? you for, for that introduction. Um, I have prepared for this session uh, a few slides that we will go through, um, so I can give you some background information now tell you a little bit about World ACD, where we stand, and then very happy to discuss some of the topics that you, uh, uh, that you would like to talk about. Um, you're absolutely right. I'm the commercial director for uh, World ACD. We're based in, uh, in Amsterdam, and our core business is uh, providing uh, data services to the air cargo industry. Uh, and we've been doing that, developing databases and developing our expertise over the last uh, almost 20 years. Um, so we have, a, I, I would say, a, a very good set of information, a very comprehensive source for the air cargo data industry uh, to be used. Um, I, I guess it's good to, to explain a, a little bit about World ACD. Uh, if we could go to the, uh, to the, to the next slide. Uh, it's a bit of an old picture, but that, that may be fitting because um, uh, our concept that World ACD hasn't changed uh, in, in general uh, over the, let's say, 20 years that we've been uh, working with parties that can provide data inputs. Our concept is that parties that are able to contribute to our database and provide uh, input data, and it could be aerial data, it could be flight level data, it's all confidential commercial information, those parties that are able to uh, provide data to us uh, are able to receive our output data as well. And that's the, that's the total market picture based in the inputs from all the uh, participants. So uh, I would say most time that we spend is doing work, a lot of work behind the scenes, uh, which is processing, validating, verifying, and cleaning uh, uh, data uh, to be able to, to produce the, let's say, the, 
the market totals that we make available to our uh, to our customers. So each party that works with us will see their own figures um, and they see the total figures. So in, in all kinds of levels of details, they're able to see their, um, their market position. And of course, the data that's provided to us um, individually is not shared with other parties. Um, but I think that's, uh, that speaks for itself. So we're uh, very careful about what we publish. We're also a completely objective and neutral uh, party in this uh, because we deal with so much sensitive and commercially sensitive information. Um, we, for example, do not give any recommendations or don't give any advice or, uh, or consultancy. And among our customers are uh, airlines. We work with close to uh, 285 airlines uh, around the world. Uh, we've also started working with forwarders uh, and with GSAs, and I can tell you a little bit more about that later. Uh, and if you look at the, uh, let's say, the overall perspective or the, the total size of our database here, yeah, we process around 1.5 million to 2 million area bills uh, per month. Uh, so roughly 65,000 on, on average uh, per day. And that data is made available in, in monthly publications and, uh, and weekly publications covering markets uh, worldwide, uh, spanning around 150 countries, individual countries uh, around the world. But uh, I would say, uh, let's have a look at some of the trends uh, that we see out there in the, in the market. If we could go to the next slide. Uh, this shows you a picture of, um, let's say the worldwide development uh, of capacity. Um, where we have looked at the information for the last three years. The, the, the green line is the year 2019, uh, the blue line is 2020, and the red line is the, the year 2021. So it's clear that if we compare uh, this year, uh, 21, with, uh, let's say, the last year pre-COVID, uh, 2019, there is pretty much a, a consistent gap of, of 20% in terms of overall worldwide um, capacity, which is of course uh, one reason for the uh, for the elevated rates uh, in the industry. So that's the supply side. If we go to the next slide, we, we look at the uh, demand side, <coughs> which provides a, a similar picture, but here we don't look at the capacity, but at the development of worldwide chargeable weight. Uh, as we all know, um, yeah, with the let's say with the drop in April last year and the gradual increase gradual but very steady increase of, of chargeable weight as of April. Right now in 2021, and if we look at, uh, let's say, the, the totals uh, for this year compared to two years ago, uh, so comparing the red line and the green line, yeah, we see that uh, 2021 is very much in line with 2019. And there's, the difference is almost 0%, and if you're very precise, it's plus uh, 0.6% um, that we're up. Um, and that's, let's say, from a high level view per month. If we go to the next slide, we're actually looking at uh, the data per week. Here we have plotted uh, uh, the same measure as on the previous slide, so with the worldwide development of chargeable weight, but not per month, but per week, with the latest week in week 37, which was uh, just over a week ago, uh, the week ending on the, on the 19th of, uh, of September. Um, and here we also see a, a fairly stable worldwide pattern, at least for the last uh, 20 weeks. So yeah, from a high level worldwide volume perspective, uh, yeah, you could conclude that 2021 is not so different as the year 2019. That's of course far from the reality. And, um, that certainly uh, yeah, different from how individual parties in the industry are experiencing the change in the market. So the high level information certainly do not tell the whole story. So uh, I would like to take you through some of the, uh, the, the details for the individual players or for groups of individual players. So look a little bit under the hood to see what's going on. Uh, starting with on the next slide, the, uh, the overview per origin region. Here we see uh, on this slide, the comparison between 2021 and 2019 again for the year to date August uh, with the worldwide, sorry, with the chargeable weights growth 
And so it's a year over two year comparison um, per origin region. And there's three regions, as you can see in the middle, Europe, Africa, and the Middle East and South Asia that have negative growth rates and have contracted. Uh, and the Americas and Asia Pacific um, have, uh, well, I would say uh, single digit positive growth figures resulting as you can see on the right uh, in an overall year to date growth for the two year over two year comparison of, of plus one uh, percent. So if your business is in Europe or in Africa or um, predominantly in the Middle East and South Africa, sorry, in South Asia, yeah, the impact of the, the changes in, in, in the market are very different than from when you're operating mostly in Asia Pacific or in the, in the Americas. Uh, different markets really uh, behave differently. I think that's, that's on a high level, the, the key message here. And that's also what we see on the next slide when we go into uh, look at sub-regions. So we see the same information here, but in this picture, we have plotted also uh, which sub-region has the most uh, and which sub-region has the, the least growth uh, experience in over the last two years. And there we see quite some differences. So if you, if you look at Europe, for example, it's um, the difference between the sub-region with highest and least growth is well not so much in percentage points. So Northern Europe increased with 0% and Western Europe contracted with minus 7%. But if you look on the right and go to Asia Pacific, you see that North Asia grew with plus 13% and Australasia met, uh, with minus 24%. So uh, that's a difference in percentage points of almost uh, 40%. Uh, and that's quite significant. So each, each market is, uh, is very different. We also, uh, uh, and, and the same is true if you look at this picture for other uh, parts of the world as well. Look, look, for example, at North America, where in Mexico you see plus 17% growth, and in Canada, uh, minus 18%. Uh, percent. Um, if, we, um, if we look at airline groups, uh, if we go to the, sorry, if we go to the next slide, uh, it's actually not yet airline groups, but it's individual cities. What we've done in, uh, in this chart, we've looked at the top five cities in each region and for the inbound plus outbound business for each of those uh, areas or regions, um, we, uh, we have looked at the, the year over two year growth. Um, so for example, when you look at Europe with the top five cities in Europe being um, uh, being Amsterdam, London, Paris, and Milan, you see here that Frankfurt had actually the largest uh, growth of uh, just over 10%. Now we've done the same uh, in the other markets and, and we've seen already that there's big differences between regions in terms of growth, there's big differences within a region um, uh, when you look at sub-regions, but also when you look at individual cities, there is uh, very different growth um, that, that we see in our database based on the inputs, of course, that we receive uh, from, uh, from the parties that we work with. So uh, if you operate, um, um, if you're a forwarder or a handler or an airline or a GSA, it makes a, a really big difference um, in terms of, let's say, the, the location where you do your business and which markets you're in. And uh, if you look at the, let's say, overall impact. So each market, uh, as I mentioned, uh, is different. So important to look at the details. Uh, if we go to the next slide, we, we look at the information from an, uh, from an airline perspective. So what we've done here in this, uh, for this chart, we've looked at airline groups and the grouping is done uh, by home region. So. We've taken the, let's say, the data from the uh, 85 airlines that we work with and grouped them per home region and um, determined what their growth has been in 2021 compared to 2019. So again, the two year comparison. Uh, striking is that uh, the carriers from Africa uh, in percentage wise performed best with an, let's say, an, an increase of business of 27% 
followed by the carriers from the Middle East and South Asia, then Asia Pacific and the Americas. And the carriers from Europe were actually the only group of carriers with a, a, a negative uh, volume growth in that two year uh, period. And that's, uh, let's say, plus 27% for carriers from Africa is particularly uh, uh, impressive because we also saw in one of the previous slides that the, the growth from Africa uh, has actually contracted. So they've really gained market share in their, uh, in their whole markets uh, as a group, of course. Uh, the individual performance of, of airlines uh, is different. Um, so that's a, that's a view on how airlines have fared uh, in the last uh, two years. In the next slide, uh, we show you how forwarders have performed. So in this slide, we've looked at the uh, top 100 forwarders in the world. Um, and we're making the same two year comparison again, comparing 2021 with 2019. In this chart, each bar represents one forwarder. Uh, and yeah, for, for good reasons, we have not listed the names of the forwarders in, in this picture, but we have identified which ones are the top 20 global forwarding. Those have been marked yellow in this, uh, in this picture. And so whereas the overall growth in the industry in the period um, that we looked at previously was plus 1% or the 0.6%, and uh, there's not many forward, forwarders actually that uh, actually realize that plus 1% growth. And you see on this, uh, in this chart that there's a very wide spectrum of, uh, of the performance of, uh, of forwarders. So all the way on the left, it's minus 70% to all the way on the right, it's, uh, it's just over uh, 65%. Uh, so also forwarders, um, we uh, have experienced very different uh, growth levels. And as you can see in this picture, that's not limited to only the top 20 global, or sorry, to, to all the forwarders, but also to the top 20 global forwarders. Some have done better than the market. Those are the ones on the, of course, on the right uh, in the yellow bars, uh, and some have not done as well uh, and did not outperform the market, the ones uh, left of the uh, of the zero percent so that's a that's a view on on forwarders um very different performances if we go to the next slide uh, we start to look at how individual gsa's how general sales agents uh, have performed uh, we build up a, a database at, at world acd that tracks which airline works with which gsa in which uh, country and that's of course a, uh, a fairly dynamic database and by combining that with the other information that we have the area build database uh, we can start to look how uh, individual gsa's are performing so if, if we look at the top 50 uh, we've done exactly the same as in the previous slide and uh, we've plotted their um, their growth over the last two years year to date august uh, and here you see that yes same as with the forwarders, the, 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 let's say the performance is very, uh, or the, I would say the spectrum of the, this performance is very wide, ranging from minus 80 on the left-hand side to, uh, I have to just move this thing that I have in front of my screen, yeah, to more than 100% uh, on the right-hand side. But you also see here, and that's uh, important to understand if you look at the dynamics in the industry, and you see here, there's more bars. Again, one bar represents one GZ. There's more bars on the right hand side and on the low and then on the left hand side. And that's because uh, GSAs as a group have, have simply uh, outperformed the market. Their overall growth in the two year period was, was close to 5% compared to the 0.6% for the industry uh, as a whole. Now, of course, um, that's all talking about volume. I'd like to turn to yield now, and that, that's or rates, and that's uh, provided in the uh, in the next slide. Where, of course, there's been a lot of talk about, also in the media, about how uh, yields and rates have changed, especially in the last few weeks. 
And that's of course also something something that we see in our own figures. And, and the chart that you see here is a, a good example of that. Um, here we uh, show the worldwide average yield uh, or rate in US dollars per kilo uh, for the last 18 weeks. And whereas for, for quite some time, I would say as of week 23 up to week 30, roughly, uh, worldwide yields have been relatively stable, uh, they have gone up significantly. And to go up from uh, $3.31 uh, in week 31 to $3.75 um, in week 37, so in a, what is that in a six week time period, which is an increase of 13% for a worldwide average, that's, that's really uh, significant. And so that's the, I would say, the, the, the yield development on an average uh, over the last few weeks. Uh, when you look at the volumes for the last few weeks, so that's an indication that we see on the next slide. Um, here we show the same yield figures, but you can also see the, let's say, the chargeable weight development. And that, of course, that fluctuates a bit from week to week. Uh, so plus 4% from week 33 to 34, then plus 1%, minus 3%, plus 1%. So September is looking uh, a bit better than, than August. Uh, but of course, the striking thing here is the, the strong increase in, uh, in yield. Um, so with, let's say, with all the dynamics going on in the industry, uh, with charter operators uh, adding capacity, and having a new role to play in uh, in air cargo, and with forwarders launching their own dedicated freight capacity, it will also be very interesting to see how uh, different types of yields are uh, developing. And I, I, on the next slide, I, I give you one example with what I mean with the type of yield, where we break down the yield realized uh, on freighters. If we can go to the next slide the average yield realized on freighters versus the average yield realized on, on passenger aircraft. And we look at the last uh, 13 months for this market. The interesting part I think is uh, what we show for the last three months. Uh, yeah, the, this is the London to, to USA Midwest uh, market, which is predominantly a, a belly capacity market. So based on our figures it's in the last three months 89 percent of the let's say of the business in in this market is carried on on passenger aircraft uh, but what we see in the last three months happening is also yeah the, i would say the divergent development of yield uh, with yields realized on freighters going up uh, very strongly compared to the yields realized on uh, on, on passenger aircraft uh, so this is, of course, only uh, one market, and each market really has its own dynamics, but we'll be at World ACD, we will be following closely uh, what will be happening with the, let's say, the, the, the freighter part of the business in relation to the, the passenger uh, aircraft developments uh, as well. So one uh, other example of how different markets uh, have performed in terms of yields or rates is shown in the in the next slide, uh, where if we go to the next slide, we see we have plotted uh, pretty much the worldwide development of yield and rates, and we've looked at five different individual markets, such as Hong Kong to the US and Mumbai to uh, to the UK, uh, and this is done by means of an index, so it's a, it's a, a relative performance, not an absolute yield figure. Uh, but it's a good example of how different uh, different markets behave when we look at yield. Uh, a, a market such as Mumbai to the UK has been relatively stable, where yields today, or I would not today, but in August, uh, were actually lower than the yields uh, in July uh, 2020. That's comparing the 94 uh, with the 100 uh, index in July 2000. Uh, uh, 2020. Now that's very different from a market like Shanghai to Germany, for example, which is the, the gray line. So I'm comparing the gray line 
uh, with the green line. So uh, lots of dynamics also in terms of yield. Um, and another way to look at that, if we go to the next slide, is to look at it per product category. And we, we distinguish in the, the data that we publish also uh, individual product categories. And this picture shows you uh, actually two things, uh, the, the yield and rates development over a two year period and the comparison um, per product category. So if we take one example, the perishables, of course, close to home here in the, in the Netherlands, and that includes flowers, but not only flowers, but also fish and seafood or fruits and vegetables. So perishables as a group, uh, the yield has increased uh, over the last two years with 43%. And uh, keep in mind that the average yield increase over that same period for the whole industry was uh, 81%. So we clearly see different uh, yield dynamics in different product categories. And general cargo was up 89%. Uh, farmer temperature controlled was up 78%. Um, at the same time, uh, perishables and valuables, live animals and dangerous goods, actually their yields did not increase as much as the, uh, as the overall uh, industry did. Now this picture or this slide also shows you the, uh, the charge chargeable weight development. So for example, you can see that overall, uh, I would say general cargo, uh, growth over the last two years was 0%. The perishables uh, was minus 6%. And uh, one, it's not surprising that the, let's say, the express part of the business um, among the, the airlines that we work with, you see that on the bottom right, the weight increased with uh, 53%. So quite some, um, quite some differences also in terms of uh, product categories. And I'd like to also show you a little bit about how uh, those individual product categories have changed. Uh, if we go to the next slide, we show you <clears throat> for the, uh, let's say the pharma temper temperature control part of the business, the top five lanes in the world. And those were the top five lanes in, uh, in 2019, in the year to date August. And we show you how those lanes have changed. So. <clears throat> Uh, very big differences. Uh, the, the South Asia to US market uh, declined with minus 30%, whereas the US to Western Europe market increased uh, with 27%. Um, so again, um, lots of differences also within different product categories, which, which makes a lot of sense. Of course, also, yeah, if you look at pharma temp, uh, a lot has uh, changed in the, in the last two years, not only supply chains, but also, for example, the, uh, the impact of, uh, of COVID. So that's one. If we go to the next slide, uh, we don't look at farmer temp anymore, but dangerous goods. We already uh, saw that the, the yield increase for dangerous goods was lower than the market. We also see uh, when we look at the, the volume development, the chargeable weight development, for the key flows in, in, in DGR, that uh, let's say the differences compared to other product categories are not that big. Uh, the biggest swing we see in, in, in the five top markets for DGR are from Europe, uh, sorry, from the USA to Western Europe with minus 7%. But for the rest, it's, it's low single digit growth. If we go to the next slide, um, we're looking at, uh, at flowers. Uh, flowers in general have done well over the last two years. They've increased with, uh, from the top of my head, five or six percent. Um, but clearly, some markets have really outperformed, such as South America to the USA with plus 24 percent, and East Africa to the Gulf area with a, with a whopping 44 uh, percent. So, flowers has done well. Uh, if we go to the next slide, I'll show you one more example. Uh, of developments of product categories, looking at fish and seafood. And there we also see quite some, some changes, uh, strong growth from Northern Europe into Northeast Asia with plus 36%. Uh, at the same time, a decline from Northern Europe to the US uh, and uh, the domestic USA market, which is also a, 
a very big fish in seafood market also contracted with uh, minus 11%. So and the last slide, if we go to the next slide that I would like to show you, uh, it's quite a busy picture, but I'll explain this to you step by step. Uh, here we have plotted uh, the top 100 city pairs and it actually brings uh, two things together. One is uh, the growth in volume, so in chargeable weight, which is shown on the, on the x-axis, the horizontal axis. And we also show the yield and rate development, which is shown on the vertical axis. There's a green dot more or less in the middle, uh, and that shows you the worldwide average. So uh, if we look at the two year comparison, very similar to what we looked at in the previous slides, uh, the worldwide overall increase was 1% uh, in terms of volume uh, and 81% in terms of yield. A uh, rate measured in US dollars per kilo. But you can clearly see um, that a lot of city pairs behave very differently. Uh, there, it, this is a scatter plot and a good example because all the city uh, pairs are very much scattered around the worldwide average. And that, uh, yeah, that means that um, yeah, they, they have very different volume uh, or rate uh, developments and, and different performance. Um, and the ones that's not unimportant to mention here, there's also um, the city pairs marked in uh, or colored orange. And uh, also those, those are the, the top city pairs in the world. They also behave uh, very differently. So that's, I would say, a lot of numbers and, uh, and figures and context about what's happening in, uh, in the markets. I'd say there's a lot more to talk about and a lot more to see, but we can't do that in the time that we have uh, available. So yeah, I would like to end by saying that um, uh, if as an individual party, you would like to understand uh, where you are in the world, where you, are, where you stand in your markets, you want to show, see what's happening in the markets that you operate in, or want to see, um, let's say, what your market share is, market position, it's really uh, important to look at the details. Let's see the high level numbers, don't often tell the whole story and the devil is in the detail and um, the detail is also where the value lies uh, when you talk about data uh, and information and i hope i've given you a, a flavor of that uh, with the different views that i've uh, presented in this presentation uh, for you today so with this uh, i've come to the end of my presentation so thanks very much Ken, that was fascinating. And, and there's a few things that stuck out there before I get into any questions. I was quite surprised with the pharma. You would expect with all the press about pharma <laughs> vaccines Sorry. moving around the world that, that yeah. it would be higher. Is that possibly because maybe UPS and FedEx aren't reporting into your data? Because they, they seem to be in the press every day of carrying this stuff. Yeah, that's, I think, one element. The other element is that when you actually look at the, the vaccines themselves, compared to other types of cardo, um, the weight is not so high. So when you, um, when you include that in the figures that we have, it's better to look at the number of shipments, I think, when looking at uh, farmer temperature control than at the, the actual weight or the, the chargeable weight. So um, you're right that the, the integrators um, have taken a, a, a big part of that business. Um, and that I would say the classic integrated business, um, which is really express par parcels and things like that. And these are not reported to us. Um, but at the same time, yeah, as I mentioned, uh, uh, the weight itself is not uh, uh, super heavy. Okay, good. Yeah. That explains it. Um, yeah. Ken, that was, it was fascinating. There's a lot of insight in there. They're interesting too about the trends. Uh, so, so basically... How uh, you've mentioned that this is confidential information. Obviously, if yeah. people are going to give you the, the raw data, they expect you to keep it confidential. Um, you've mentioned your customer base is mostly the airlines that give you the data, forwarders and GSAs. GSAs are, are de facto airlines anyway, so yeah. they're representing airlines. Where do the forwarders fit into this? What kind of data are they looking for from you? 
Yeah, so um, I'd say at, at World ASD for, for, for many years, we've only worked with, with airlines. And we started with, I would say, a handful of airlines uh, and a handful of lanes many years ago. Um, and uh, it was not until two years ago that we also started working with forwarders. And they provide us uh, under the same concept that we have. So no inputs, no outputs. So those forwarders that are able to provide data inputs also for uh, uh, aerial data, uh, if they're able to provide the data and their data is uh, in good order, they're able to subscribe uh, as well. And of course they receive a, a different type of uh, data output. So we have different types of customers and each of those different types of customers gets a, I would say, a different data proposition. Well, the reason uh, I ask is because yeah. I was quite uh, struck by the, the the chart of the growth of the forwarders. And I saw yeah. that when you saw the growth, it was more in the, let's call it SME, small, medium size versus the big 20, the top 20. And really it's these days, the top no. four. Uh, is that because of who reports to you or is that really a trend no. you see now? No, so the picture I've shown you, uh, that's based on the air rebuild data from the airlines and in the inputs that they provide, they also give the, the agent name and the agent code. And that allows us to do a lot of, I would say, data classification behind the scenes. So we map each air rebuild to an individual uh, forwarder. Uh, and that's strictly based on, on airline inputs. Um, <clears throat> and that allows you, us to publish for the airlines uh, data per forwarder. And if you, if you look at our database, we have yeah, more than uh, 15,000 different forwarders uh, in the database. Of course, granted, if you look at the top 10, they make up around one third of the market and the, the top 20 forwarders uh, just over 40%. So there's a, a very long tail of, uh, let's say, smaller forwarders, the SMEs, but those are not, uh, not unimportant, not at all. Yeah. No. They're very important. Yeah, exactly. But but then then the, the question arises: um, the own capacity, own control of capacity that the forwarders are putting in into the market. My personal opinion is they're doing this because the airline industry has failed to give them what they need. Because the airplanes are obviously there, because or yeah. else or else they wouldn't be able to do what they're doing, right? Yeah. Um, so if, if, if the own control forwarders are, are growing uh, the way they are, uh, do you, are you getting in any indication this is going to affect uh, the numbers coming out? I'm just asking for a professional opinion now, not, not really based on your data. Does this give you a, an indication only major trade lanes, for example, will be impacted by the own control freighter uh, market or uh, do you think well, it will be right across the board? Well, I, th I think the... The, the forwarders that start to to uh, use their own capacity, they will focus um, on the key lanes, of course, uh, and that's also where small or SME forwarders are active. So that could have an impact. But if if you look at where uh, forwarders are are located, there there are there are so many. So outside of let's say the key lanes where that uh, capacity is going to be used by forwarders, yeah, there's lots of markets uh, markets left. So I think there will also be ways for SME forwarders, perhaps to cooperate more, um, um, to 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 have an answer to that as well. Well, that, that's interesting because that, you know we we want to see them sur uh, survive, yeah, um, and and be supported because they're definitely needed in the business. Uh, are you ever your client base is sharing with you any information that might give some? This is historical just by virtue of what it is. It might be yesterday's information, but I mean, when I say yesterday's information, meaning really yesterday, not uh, six months ago, but are they giving you an indication when they're talking to you? Do you ever get in, into any discussions with any of them of what they think is gonna happen going forward with things like e-commerce, mm -hmm. with the rest of the de uh, developments uh, in the world of how these trade lanes might uh, um, might grow or, or subside in the yeah. future? Yeah, I, I think, I mean, of course, the, the multi-million dollar question for, for everybody is, uh, when will there be more capacity again? Uh, also for, for all kinds of forwarders right? and in general for the industry. Uh, so the one that can answer that question uh, <clears throat> um, is, is in a good place. At the same time, it's, it's really hard to determine. 
Uh, I think that uh, that's my, my personal view that, uh, let's say, the question of when people will start flying again uh, depends on a lot of things and they all have their own dynamics, which also makes it so difficult to, to understand when things would become more normal again uh, than they are today. So you have, of course, the, the continued COVID regulations, which has an impact on, on, on people traveling. Uh, but there's also economic aspects. And I think there's also, let's say, the, the attitude of, of people in general towards flying. Uh, I mean, you and I are doing this, this call now uh, online, uh, and it might have been uh, very different uh, two years ago. Uh, we also at World ACD, we do so many of our calls now online. We used to go for training sessions to the other side of the world, spend the day and fly back again. Yeah, that's we now break it up into 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 multiple sessions, which makes uh, makes a lot of sense. So, yeah, I agree. I think with, with most people that business travel will come back, but uh, at lower levels. And for uh, let's say leisure, yeah, that that remains to be seen a bit. But there's also the the I would I would say the attitude of of people towards flying um, might be different than it was two years ago. People have explored their I would say almost their neighborhood more uh, and may not jump on a plane to to visit the other side of the world for uh, for a weekend uh, again that, so that's, that's, we'll, that's definitely for sure yeah so we'll, we'll see what happens there yeah well i'm anxious to get back to amsterdam so i mean that's yeah my, well that, that, that's my home in, in a yeah. lot of ways as well <laughs> yeah. um one of the things that i saw from from one of your charts was there's a relatively flat shall we say over the whole year where we're traditionally used to Christmas peaks and an end of financial yeah. peaks and whatever. Now, now it seems to be flattening out and I would venture to guess and correct me if I'm wrong, that's basically capacity driven. I mean, if there's, you can only put so much into a yeah. into an aluminum tube and after that, there's no more to be put there. Is, is that the reason for that sort of flattening? And that leads me to the next question. Yeah. See a dramatic increase in yield in the last uh, six weeks. Yeah. Uh, is, oh, well, I'll be blunt. Is that price gouging or is that simply people are willing to pay more because of all the mess that's going on in Seafreight at the moment. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a bit of both, I think. I mean, we've seen the, uh, the, the let's say, the, the capacity constraints uh, <clears throat> in Asia, and that, of course, have, uh, has had an impact on, uh, on rates going up. Um, and yeah, I would say there's, there's so many different dynamics at play there. Of course, it has to do with capacity, as you mentioned. And I think that is probably the, the most important reason. Uh, but there's also, um, yeah, especially in China, uh, the, the inability for people to go to work and, and handle uh, freight. So that has, a, uh, has an impact on the, on the rates. Yeah, well, and, the I think seems it, to be there, it, though. It seems to be moving, Ken. I mean... So if the cargo, what, you know, I, that, I thought of the same, you know, we heard about the GHA problems, we hear about people not being available, we hear about some shutdowns, for example, yeah. terminals, whatever, but the, the cargo is still moving, it's moving pretty regularly. Um, uh, if I look at Chicago and New York at the moment, from what I'm hearing anyways, from the forwarders, uh, it, it, it's a catastrophe going on because they're just overloaded to the point where they're talking maybe uh, you know, are we going to embargo or are the airports going to put embargo? So the cargo must be getting on an airplane. Um, yeah. So the yield going up is, is the question. Um, um, the only commercial uh, reason I can think of, well, there's the obvious commercial one. If you can get it, why not take it? But there's the other thing is as a diversion uh, uh, to more critical uh, things moving by air than, the, than ever before because of the, the, the drama that's going on with the rest of the uh, logistics industry, particularly with things like semiconductor shortages or whatever. Yeah. So is it is it commodities? Do you think the commodities are getting richer um, and maybe displacing some other things? That's why it's 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 sort of status on on volumes, but the value of the cargo that's actually flying is so important now that they're willing to pay more. Or or what what what's your opinion? Well, I think. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure because I think if that was the case, we would have seen it um, earlier in the year as well. So let's say that that increase that we have seen over the over the last few weeks 
uh, I think that's that's mainly uh, capacity driven. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, if, if I had a, a crystal ball, uh, I could tell you a little bit more about how things would develop. I think in, in the end, uh, un, until uh, more belly capacity will become available, um, yeah, we, we may have to get used to the situation that we're in. Uh, becoming the the new normal for uh, for a little while. So uh, where where that will develop to? Uh, I think I think it will take some time before things become um, more like the way we uh, used to know them two two years ago. Oh, we'll and in the meantime, yeah, we, yeah. I was going to say, Ken, if we both had crystal balls, we'd be very rich men, wouldn't we? <laughs> yeah, we would. Well, good Good to mention that at World ACD, of course, we look back uh, and not forward. We, we've we tried to make uh, forecasts uh, and we have the right people in the house. We have data scientists who can who can run the numbers, and but we've never been able to really create an, an, a forecast that we thought was sufficiently accurate. So we'd rather not publish a forecast than publish one that is, is not accurate. Uh, however, if, if I look in general, if I look at the, the COVID period uh, and uh, what that has done to our customers, we, we do notice that, that their attitude towards data, data analytics has, has really, uh, I would say, changed. That has received a, a, a lot more attention. Uh, and that also means that we, yeah, we got more involved in trying to get, um, let's say, the best possible insights uh, out of the information um, that we could give them. So we're looking at new types of segmentations, new types of information. Um, and that's, uh, I would say, that's a, I would say a silver lining of the, um, of the COVID problems that we've had. That it has really accelerated some of the developments that were already happening, uh, such as, yeah, I would say, uh, in general, I would say the digitalization uh, uh, development. Well, Chris Nodder, um, uh, my co-anchor uh, for all of these shows, has said one, something this morning. Uh, why let a good crisis go to waste? So maybe, maybe there's yeah. something to be learned in that, right? Yeah. That's, look at the opportunities. And yeah. Dive into the details. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, look, uh, we we'll talk about customer base. You mentioned forwarders. You mentioned GSAs. You mentioned airlines. But there is a whole new customer base out there, and that's the e-retailers, obviously. And they're not all dealing through forwarders, and they 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 want to be considered the same as a forwarder in effect because they have such volumes. I'm not talking about just yeah. Alibaba and Amazon. I'm talking about there's there's hundreds out there who are huge entities in themselves, and they would crave information like you have uh, in order to be able to decide on. Let's say, for example, do we include shipping in our price? Do we offer free shipping? Do we go to FedEx or to go to UPS or do we go to yeah. ALM or Air France? Um, is there any chance that maybe different subsets of from World ACD could cater to different markets uh, in a way that uh, would help? Uh, because we have to accept something. Yeah. The large forwarders are getting much, much larger. The SMEs yeah. are under, under threat. We know that because of the cost of doing business. Um, but one of the major forwarders uh, who has been swallowed, well, I'll tell you, it was Panalpina before they were swallowed up uh, by uh, DSV and, and, you know, they're both great companies, but mm -hmm. Panalpina uh, conceded that uh, there's one of the problems they have is there's uh, too much data available out there on the web as to pricing and everything else. So it's hard to make margin on the buy and sell between what they can buy it from an airline and what they can sell it to a, to a customer who can find all the information they want on the web. Is there any possibility World ACD would look at uh, some uh, differentiation of product for, for these uh, people who really need your type of information, like uh, e-commerce retailers, um, others like that? Yeah, I would say that um, I'd say any, any party that is, is able to provide data inputs is, is, is very happy to uh, I'd say data inputs that will um, enrich our database in general. And they're, they're more than welcome to, um, to, to speak to us. And one of the developments I think that we have seen is from working with forwarders 
um, they <clears throat> they're interested in, of course, their customers are shippers, uh, including the let's say the, the e-commerce companies that, that you refer to. Uh, and we've had forwarders, um, um, yeah, also talk to us about what we could do to uh, help them to become um, uh, more transparent about what price developments are. Uh, it's not so much a price transpa transparency issue, it's more about making some level available to understand what rate changes have been. So we've developed uh, uh, earlier this year, a uh, World ACD rate index, and you've seen some example of this in the in the presentation that I shared. Uh, and that's mostly for uh, for airlines or for forwarders that uh, like to um, uh, th that work with parties and that could be shippers, and uh, and like to agree upfront about how um, let's see how price changes will, will influence the, uh, their contract. So uh, you could look at that as index-based contracts, and that's one example of it. Um, and that's available now, and we've developed that. So it's, I think it's important for us at World ACD to, to understand what, the, let's say, the, the different needs are in the industry that's involving, and we're working with more uh, different types of parties. So, uh, we keep a good eye on uh, on those developments, but the the rate index, the world is the rate index is uh, uh, is exactly developed to to track that. It's of course not an absolute rate figure, uh, but a, a relative change, so really an index. Uh, but that can be used by parties that uh, that are interested in that. Well, one of the other things um, um, I, I know I, I sent you a copy, and you heard from Courtney at IKO, you know that the governments are getting heavily involved now in things like safety and security for obvious reasons, but they're also yeah. getting heavily involved in data um, because the UN is pushing now for uh, uh, data sharing. Uh, yeah. And they're also trying to find ways and they are working very hard at it in, in the integrity of the data because one of the things that people are worried about today, and I imagine you are as well, it's, it's cybersecurity. And, and um, can you tell me how you go about based on, on the you know, rather sensitive information you hold? Are you, um, are you looking at this as, a, as something that, that you've got to address as well, this cybersecurity threat? And the second thing is, <coughs> if governments, excuse me, <coughs> if governments are getting heavily involved in data now uh, through, uh, tr for trade facilitation, reasons uh, yeah. not so much rates obviously but just what's going on in the world yeah um, that seems to me that that again will be something more accessible on the web um and and various parties will want to have it and and i think our industry needs transparency more transparency we have the better we can survive against competitive threats from other modes uh, but also competitive threats from from let's say these uh mega e-commerce companies. So how do the airlines that are your customers survive if they don't know exactly what's going on out there? Do you get involved uh, with, with government authorities and people like that, uh, cargo community systems, things like this, where, where perhaps uh, assembling data for the use of, other than airlines, uh, the airline data for rates, I can understand the sensitivity, mm -hmm. but for an airport like Schiphol, for example, they have cargo not. But can you complement a, a Cargonaut uh, in, in any way or people like you? There are other service providers, I assume. Yeah, and so the thing uh, you refer to, so for example, initiatives by governments, we, we have not been involved in. So our, our focus has really been on airlines and forwarders and GSAs. But we're also speaking to, to airports and they can also, uh, and if I just look at World ACD, there's, there's of course two things that one is, let's say, the how the industry is is further developing and accelerating the digitalization, which is great, accelerated by COVID. And that will take away barriers that are really important to take away. Um, at the same time, if I if I would apply that to, to us at World ACD, um, we, we serve individual parties. So uh, we take the input data from one individual party. We uh, observe that, of course, to see if that's 
uh, in line with our own standards and what it makes a contribution to the database. And if that's the case, um, um, also for an airport, they, they could subscribe to, to, to the world ACD data. Because airports, of course, have a, a specific data available that they could make available as input data uh, as well. So uh, for a long time, we have not done that, but we see the opportunities uh, with different types of companies providing different types of inputs to also make a contribution. So uh, that's certainly something that we're that we're looking at. But we're not involved with, uh, let's say, freight communities or uh, or governments and such. Okay. Well, the theme of this conference is building back better. So um, the idea is, uh, like like I mentioned before, we've learned a lot of lessons and we've been able to pull things off in the past 18 months, which are absolutely extraordinary. When you think about uh, the passenger airplanes flying freight and then thousands and thousands, and when you think about all the things that people have had to go to at the same time coping with a pandemic, it's quite extraordinary, really. It's quite, a, 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 quite an industry we're in. Um, but Ken, if you had a crystal ball, um, how do you think the air cargo scene is going to evolve? I mean, again, I go back to what I said before. If more data is going to be available to more people in a transparent way through the web, uh, yeah. let's be honest, other than proprietary information, which, which an airline doesn't want to share for competitive reasons, data transparency can, can facilitate a lot of things. It can facilitate uh, environmental improvement, for example, Trucks don't have to wait so long if everybody knows completely in advance what's coming in a common platform. So if I know I'm getting 100 boxes coming in on, on an airplane and I need uh, 10 guys to offload it, or if I'm getting uh, that same weight or same chargeable weight coming in with only three uh, skids and I only need one forklift driver, I can save in all kinds of things. Economically, I can save and environmentally, I can save because I can process things faster and move the truck on its way. So data sharing, um, uh, there's a separation between what a company like yourself does and Seabury does, for example, um, is fine. Uh, you have a business to run, I can understand that. But a certain part of the data uh, transparency or data proprietary, shall we say, uh, could be taken away by, by the need of governments, airports, uh, customs and border protection, economic security, look at things that are being done with uh, misdeclared goods in e-commerce. I think we're, we're headed to a world with more data transparency. Where do you see uh, companies like yourself fitting in in that new world? Yeah, so I think that there's really two different things. You have the, the industry in general um, developing further and sharing data, which takes away some barriers and, and makes, uh, let's say, facilitates uh, trade with less efficiency. That's one thing, uh, which is a really good thing because, uh, I mean, it's been talked about for, for a long time in the industry that there is a, a need to, to share more data and to be more digital. Uh, and that facilitates trade and is good for the industry. So that's on, the, on let's say, on the one hand uh, of the, or one element uh, to your question. Um, the other is companies such as World ACD. Uh, I think that a lot of companies that we've spoken to over the last two years have become much more uh, aware of, let's say, the value of their own data, uh, even, even without a market perspective, just using their own data in a, in a better way. And it doesn't have to be, um, let's say, a machine learning immediately or a difficult, or, or, well, it doesn't have to be difficult, but artificial intelligence. There's uh, already, I would say, uh, um, uh, a lot of things you can do with, with basic information. So the, the importance of having your data in order, it, irrespective of what kind of party you are in the whole supply chain is, is really important. Uh, and that helps us as a company as well, uh, because better data um, from individual players helps us to, uh, to expand our database uh, and, and provide more insights uh, as well. So. Uh, we, we, we welcome the opportunity, let's say, uh, as part of the whole industry, um, to have more focus on digitalization and unlocking additional data, which helps us also to, to build additional data products. So um, it's, a, it's a good thing for everybody, for individual players and for the industry as a well. whole. 
I'm, gl I'm glad to hear that because, you know, basically, uh, I, I, I just reminds me of something somebody told me about a week ago or so we were having a chat. They had met with uh, the board of uh, Alibaba and uh, the comment was because he was baffled of, after talking to him. He said, what's your real core business? And the answer came back was, well, we have two core businesses. Number one is we pay because we want to control the money. But the second thing we want is the data because we control the data. And if we control the money and we control the data, everything else is just complementary to that, including our logistics arm. And I bet if we spoke to Jack, uh, Jack, sorry, uh, to uh, Bezos, uh, he would probably tell you the same thing. The person who controls the money and the data controls everything. So data transparency obviously is, is, is a critically important for everyone to, to be able to survive in this air cargo industry going forward. And, and you, you have a yeah, uh, exactly. tremendous role to play in that. You know, exactly. We, yeah, we see companies becoming more data-driven. They invest in analytics. They want to compete uh, on, on analytics as well. So uh, it's not only about, uh, let's say, the, the survival of the largest or, and, the, and the strongest, but uh, also the fittest and the, the companies that are most data savvy as well. So the, the data savviest companies, and that's gonna re really gonna be the, the new era as well in, uh, in air cargo. Yeah. Totally agree, totally agree. Well then, thank, first of all, thank you very much. That was really interesting, and especially for me, I'm a data freak. I mean, just basically, I love, love the fact of, of what we can do when we know what's coming and what's leaving. I mean, it's just as simple as that. Um, but having lis listened and, and thought uh, and also you know, heard from IKO, uh, what are the key points and challenges uh, that are going on here and seeing it with your own customer base? If you had a clean slate, I mean, you weren't working for World ACD anymore, you just were sitting there and you could wave a wand. What three things, and I'm gonna put you on the spot here, what three things do you think could help this industry to grow? And, and obviously you're in the data side of it, uh, yeah. but, uh, but you, you have exposure to everything. Is, is there three things that you think uh, we could put up there um, next year? We're hoping to meet face-to-face -face in Rome with this conference. Uh, it would be nice that COVID allows us to have that to happen in a safe and secure way. And what we'd like to do is put up a sort of bulletin board and, and say, this is what Ken told us and did we achieve it, yes or no? So can you can you share a couple of points that you well, know, three points if you could. Yeah. Uh, what I'll, you'd like to see I'll, happen? I'll, I'll give you, let me give you two points. The third one, I'll, I'll let you know when we meet them uh, in, in person. Okay. Well, of course, one has to be about data because that's what we're in. So further use of data and data sharing uh, also with companies like us, of course. And, uh, I would call uh, that digitization as well. Yeah, it's uh, digitalization in, in general. Um, at the same time, uh, I think it's an old theme, but uh, when you take small steps, you can come a long way. The second one is, <clears throat> I would say, break down the, the, the different silos in the industry or where there are silos uh, cooperate further. Um, that's how we will uh, advance. And that's not an easy task because of the, all the different players that are involved uh, to move uh, cargo from point A to point B to the end point. There's so many interfaces involved in so many different parties. But uh, if you can t make slow steps and uh, break down uh, the barriers that exist, um, that would be great. And that's been happening for a long time. There's lots of talks about that already uh, taking place. Uh, but we, we, uh, I think it's accelerating, and that's a good thing for the industry. And I'll you know, think about and it that, that. That's that's if if everybody would even if they only shared twenty percent of their data for the common good, for environmental reasons, and also for economic reasons for the total mm -hmm. industry, it would be fantastic if we could achieve that in one year. And then the yeah. third one, you don't want to take a take a stab, or you or you definitely, uh, I'll buy you a beer uh, when we yeah. go tomorrow <laughs> if you want. <laughs> uh, let me think about that one. Uh, right. It will well, be a good a topic for next next call. Oh no, you send you send us an email with the third one if you can think of it, and we'll definitely put it on the bulletin board so that when we come to Rome, we can okay. say, "Hey, you know what, Ken, you brought it up, and we did it as an industry." Not, not okay, as, good. Yeah. All right. Well, look Let's with that. Uh, uh, sorry, Ken, I didn't mean to interrupt. interrupt. 
You were going to say no, something? No, I said, okay. no, no, I said, let's do that. Good plan. All right. Well, look, Ken, first of all, thank you very, very much. All the best to you. Um, I, I hope you realize anyways that we're very sympathetic to the fact that uh, data, data transparency especially, but digitization to get there. One of the things that, uh, that the uh, big integrator told me recently was that uh, the, what, they would be fully digital right now, except for the fact that governments are yet to trust data. So, um, mm -hmm. and the way we transfer it. So maybe we'll get there and, and, and then what you can provide to the industry will be even more valuable than it is today. So with that, I'd like to thank you a lot. And uh, if there's anything else you'd like to say before we wrap up, uh, personally, I would just wanna thank you very much for taking the time out to, to share your thoughts with our audience. Well, thanks very much then. It's been a pleasure um, to, to speak to you over the last hour. Uh, I look forward to uh, to giving you uh, the pointer number three by email and discussing that further. Um, and yeah, there's there's lots of work to be done. So I hope this conference uh, will inspire people uh, as well to uh, to spring into action and, and take things further for the industry. So thank you thank for you the uh, opportunity of having me on the uh, on, in the conference program. Okay, and the best of, best of uh, luck with everything and um, let's build things back better and make it matter too. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, Stan.